Welcome, Margaret and Alexandra. Good evening. Welcome, bienvenidos, friends of the Hispanic Society, to Las Tertulias de Arte Hispano. I'd like to just take a moment to thank our members who have joined us monthly and also welcome those who are new and watching for the first time. We continue these conversations on the first Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. If you're not a member yet, please consider joining by going to our website at hispanicsociety.org and search for membership under support. My name is Margaret Connors Aquaid. I'm the deputy director and head of collections of the Hispanic Society, um, where I've been for, believe it or not, 29 years. I also specialize in decorative arts with a particular focus on ceramic traditions. Um, it is my extraordinary privilege to welcome again, Alexandra Rodriguez Jack, who just completed a year at the Hispanic Society as a curatorial research fellow, supported by the Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller's Brother Fund with additional support from the Queen Sophia Spanish Institute. Alex is finishing her master's thesis at Parsons School of Design in New York through Kerper Hewitt Smithsonian Museum. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez Jack, who I often call Alex, um, is uh, also a former curatorial fellow at uh, the Smithsonian. Um, most recently, she was a co-assistant curator at the Hispanic Society's exhibition, American Travelers, A Watercolor Journey Through Spain, Portugal, and Mexico, which I will add closes on October 16th. So if you haven't seen it, um, I really encourage you to see the exhibit. Um, Alex has been involved with the exhibit, exhibit in so many ways, um, including giving tours. She uh, really was a big part of the catalog, the installation, um, and designed the catalog. Um, and I felt it was really important to bring her into this discussion um, this evening. Um, so for our presentation today, we kind of took the idea of the exhibition and the enormous influence um, that travel to Spain, Portugal, and Mexico has been to artists, um, and in particular, the artists represented in the show. Um, the show also included various examples of ceramic traditions, and pottery has been such an important part of uh, travel. Um, not only do we learn a lot about these various cultures um, through these ceramic traditions when we travel, but these pieces also end up being things that, um, being that they're so portable and, um, and so likable, uh, travelers often take them home um, as sort of a, a piece of, of a mem memory of, of their travels. Um, and this is not just today, but over centuries. Um, so tonight we're gonna take, a, take you in a bit of a journey um, over terrain. Um, and I'm just going to, just give me a moment and I will share my screen. There we go. So we have ceramic traditions from the Hispanic Society collection. It's really a, a tour of our, of our vast collections. So here we go. Here's the uh, really wonderful exhibition curated uh, by Marcus Burke uh, with Alex Rodriguez, as well as Orlando um, Hernandez, um, who were a big part of the success of this show. And as you can see, there are a number of ceramics represented. So I am going to then, I want to briefly show you a map of all the areas uh, that we will be touching on today um, where the, the pottery traditions um, represented in this uh, presentation. However, I just wanna add that really every area uh, in, in all these, in, in both in Spain uh, as well as Portugal, uh, through South America and Mexico and the Caribbean, you find ceramic traditions, but we are focusing on the ones uh, shown, uh, highlighted in this these maps uh, today. So with that, we're going to go back in time to, uh, what is it, 3000 before the Christian era, and I give it off to, to Alex. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I just want to preface this by expressing my immense gratitude to Margaret for everything I have learned, especially over the past year, but just as a mentor and a friend, most of what I'm about to share with you tonight has been generously imparted by her research and invaluable contributions to the field. 
So just want to give credit where credit is due. And of course, I would like to thank Dr. Burke and my co-assistant curator Orlando and all of my dear colleagues and friends at the Hispanic Society for all of their support and wisdom. So as we begin our journey, I want to briefly draw attention to these incredible pre-Roman vessels that were excavated near Carmona um, in Seville. Although my research at the Hispanic Society has provided me with opportunities to interact with the glaze ceramics, I knew very little about these pre-Roman pieces until fairly recently. And these examples that we have here were produced at the end of the Copper Age around 2400 BCE. And um, the Hispanic Society boasts one of the finest and most complete collections of bell beaker ceramics. And just a little background, the first evidence of the bell beaker culture appears in Portugal around 2800 BC and um, then proceeds to spread across the Iberian Peninsula into Western Europe and then extends north all the way to present day UK and then across the con continent to um, Western Germany. So also the Hispanic society contains quite a number of impress uh, very impressive ancient Roman ceramics from the second century, which were also discovered near Seville. Um, the Iberian Peninsula saw the rise of key provincial Roman cities as evidenced by the troves of excavated objects and impressive archeological remains of architecture and infrastructure, which you can still see to this day. And in addition to these ceramics, the Hispanic society also has Roman mosaics, silver, glass, bronzes, marble sculptures, as well as tools. And all of these provide very remarkable insight into the artistic advancements of this period. So the rest of the pieces I'm going to, that we, together we're gonna to be talking about are um, glazed, you'll see. And I just wanted to take a moment to kind of understand the importance of these glazed traditions. Um, for centuries, China held the secret for um, creating the world's finest pottery known to us as porcelain. Um, but it took the rest of the world a very long time, centuries, to understand exactly how to make porcelain. Um, most pottery was made from earthenware, um, and uh, the earliest glazed ware were made with lead oxides um, as early as 200 BC. But the ox glazed oxides really just gave a kind of a transparent glaze over the earthenware. Um, and it was in the ninth century that kind of we, we understand that there was a major discovery made in the Middle East that by adding tin oxide to the transparent lead glaze, they could create an opaque surface. And that was sort of a white ground that not only um, covered the color of the clay, but also gave um, the appearance of porcelain. Um, and it also was a blank surface um, that could be decorated. Um, and this is really fundamental to the story of what we, you know, what many of us call myolica. Um, and myolica is just really synonymous with the uh, term tin and lead-based glazed earthenware. It's just a mouthful. Um, so we have other words to describe it, but myolica, um, you know, the, the word talavera is also synonymous with uh, tin and lead-based glazed earthenware. Uh, Fions, um, delps, they all kind of mean the same thing, but from different um, areas. And I'm showing you here this really tour de force of a uh, piece of um, glazed earthenware from the 15th century in Toledo. Um, and it is glazed, believe it or not. Um, it's three feet in diameter. Um, and it represents one of the five surviving fonts um, made in tin glazed um, in Toledo in the first half of the 15th century. And it's actually the only one known in the United States and in an American collection. So those of you who are potters or if you've ever made pottery, you'll understand what it must have been to, to fire a piece this large. Um, the kiln itself must have been quite large. And so it's, it's while you, know, you, you look at it in different ways, but it kind of explains the, um, what happened in that kiln. It's not per a perfect piece, but it, it really was a difficult um, technique to fire at particularly at this size. Um, and I just wanna very briefly um, discuss the decoration. So we have here um, the, this uh, cross of 
um, Golgotha, and then we have the monogram of Christ, the IHS. Um, but we also have other kind of this um, confluence of, of traditions that is quite typical of Toledo. Um, we have, uh, I don't know if you can see, there are these hands uh, represented throughout uh, the, the, the piece. And I actually have another slide here, um, which um, shown in both the green glaze, and then it's also impressed on the inside of the font. Now the hand eye motif um, is actually an ancient symbol of the um, hand of, of Fatima, that, as we know it today, which was a protective talisman against evil in, a, in the Islamic world, especially for women and children. And this, um, what's interesting is on the underside of the vessel is this um, sort of drawing of what appears to be like a thistle plant. And my colleague and friend, Heather Eckert, suggests that it could represent uh, the blessed thistle um, that was used to treat the plague. Um, and actually Toledo at this time was deeply affected by, by the plague in the mid 14th century. So to have it on this sort of sacred object is quite um, symbolic here and would have served as kind of a prophylactic um, to protect the, the, the baptized child. So it's really quite a wonderful piece and we're very fortunate to have it at the Hispanic Society. So when people think about Spanish pottery um, in, in general, it's lusterware is really what often comes to mind um, and particularly lusterware from Manises. Um, so it's not surprising that the Hispanic society really has, it's like the, 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 the great strength of the collection is in the lusterware collection. And we have more than 150 uh, pieces um, that Huntington, our founder amassed in, in less than like, a period of a decade. So it's really quite um, extraordinary. Now, I just want to go back to what I talked about, uh, myolica, the tin glazed earthenware. Another uh, technique that was brought from the Middle East is, is um, the addition of a uh, copper and silver oxides to what we call the tin lead based glazed earthenware. They fire it for a third time, which gives us wonderful iridescent and metallic um, oxide. They actually fire it um, in a reduction kiln. Um, which allows this to give this effect. Um, now, the production of lusterware was among, among the most important artistic techniques that was introduced by Muslim potters, not only to the um, Iberian Peninsula, but you do see it um, in other areas um, as well as in, in Italy. Um, and lusterware was imported um, in Spain um, as early as the 10th century, when uh, much of the country was under Muslim rule. But by the 13th century, lusterware was being made in the south of Spain, primarily in the cities of Murcia, Almeria, and Malaga. And the density of decoration and the sort of pseudo-Arabic script, the tree of life, interlacery, um, really are quite typical of very, very early uh, production in Spain. Um, and of the what we call the Nazareth style. Um, and I'm just gonna very quickly go through some of the wonderful pieces that we have in the collection. And this is a very typical form on the left, the pharmaceutical jar, um, which is known as an albarello, um, which was again, an, an Islamic form that was brought um, into Spain, um, as well as this basin um, on the right. And it's not uncommon to see um, European coats of arms on these pieces, um, which really speak to the popularity. I mean, these were, if you were anybody of great importance, you had to have uh, a lusterware piece with your coat of arms. Um, uh, here we go. Here's another one with a um, coat of arm from the Despujol family of Catalonia. And this is a, a, a great example with the coat of arms of the Nuri family of Florence. Now, even in Florence, while they were producing lusterware, they were importing uh, pieces from, from Spain. Um, and uh, one kind of side story that I learned, um, this is the coat of arms probably of uh, Francisco Nuri, who was actually a good friend of um, Lorenzo de Medici um, and was actually 
he lost his life because of his friendship and kind of a long story. But it was kind of this piece was probably made at the time uh, just before he uh, was uh, killed. In any case, um, moving along, I just wanted to. Oops. Oh, here we go. This is give you an idea of the real wealth we have in our collection. It's quite um, astonishing. Just the various, I think I keep going and we've got a few more pieces. And our collection uh, starts of lusterware is as early as the 14th century. Um, and it goes through kind of the high period of production um, in the 15th century. And then we have examples from the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and even early 20th century. And they're not all just from Valencia, but also from other areas of Spain where lusterware uh, was made. Um, so by the 16th century, the production of uh, lusterware continued to be made, as I mentioned, but it didn't have the same popularity, largely because um, the Italians were, were introducing new colors, new decorations, um, and just like any style, you know, things, uh, fashion changes. Um, but one area that did become an important, um, very important was Talavera in um, central um, Spain. Um, and the we know as early as like 1521, ceramic workshops start opening uh, there uh, to produce uh, tin glazed earthenware with these wonderful uh, pieces um, that clearly have influence from both the Middle East and even from from Asia. Um, and you know what's what we often are familiar with the word Talavera because the word becomes synonymous. It was such an important uh, area of production that the term Talavera becomes synonymous with Maiolica. Uh, so you'll hear people ca call something Talavera. And it, there really doesn't necessarily mean it was made in Talavera um, because, um, but actually just sort of that white glaze that so typical of that area of production. Um, and I just, a, a side note, and I'll get to in a moment, um, many are also familiar with the Mexican Talavera, which is quite different. So I just wanted to point that out there, but we'll get there, we'll get there um, in a moment. It's believed that the first workshops um, in Talavera were founded by potters from Antwerp um, and who were commissioned by Philip II to make tiles and pottery for his palace at the Escorial, as well as other royal buildings. And I think it was really those commissions that popularized the workshops in Talavera. And here's a wonderful pair of apothecary jars with the coat of arms of the Escorial. Another style that I really love is this um, lace uh, pattern design that Talavera became particularly well known for. And I'm just on the right showing some lace pattern books from our collection, which is really quite a privilege for us to have this type of material that we can relate to our uh, art collection. The most popular of all the designs um, in the 17th century was this tree color uh, decoration. And here's a wonderful example with this sort of uh, soldier um, with this kind of funny hat. Um, and um, more, a, a more recent acquisition is this, uh, also it's a tricolor piece from Talavera and kind of the jury's out. I mean, we believe it's Jonah and the whale, um, really quite an oversized whale, um, but um, we're still trying to figure out if that's exactly what's being depicted here. Nevertheless, it's really quite, quite wonderful. And I just wanna say that Almost all the pieces that I've shown you are uh, recent acquisitions made um, in the past uh, 15 years. Now, one of the pieces that's been really quite popular in the exhibit is this um, aquamanil um, in the form of this female beast um, that uh, from Portugal, from Lisbon, and it's from the 17th uh, century. And, um, it's, you know, we're still trying to figure out exactly um, what the source is for this form, which is so unusual. And it's only a handful of pieces that are known um, to have to be made in this form. Um, but um, one idea that we have is that it comes from a, a kind of a local, a very local um, 
mythic creature known as the coca. Um, maybe this is the source of um, for this uh, piece. The coca is actually a form that's part of very much part of popular culture in uh, Portugal um, and brought alive during festivities and has been for centuries um, for things such as Corpus Christi, which I'm showing you here on the right. Um, now, why someone thought to translate this form into a serving um, uh, vessel um, is kind of a, a curiosity that we all have um, and something we may not be able to answer, but it's certainly something that we should be thinking about and is interesting. Um, so more typical of Portuguese um, uh, earthenware are these um, more sort of Chinese style pieces. And of course the trade with, with the Portuguese were among the first to initiate uh, trade with, with China and um, export porcelain. And it certainly impacted their own production in Lisbon uh, with these wonderful pieces. To you, Alex. So these two pieces of late 19th century Portuguese palace wear were also a surprise hit of the American Travelers exhibition based on visitor feedback. Um, these unusual designs were based on much earlier forms from 17th century France produced by Bernard Palissy. And Bernard Palissy was uh, working contemporaneously with the beginning of what we would now call the scientific revolution. And he had the rather morbid creative process of live casting from the corpses of real amphibian or reptilian subjects to create these realistic subjects for vibrantly naturalistic three-dimensional plates. And now if we fast forward to the mid 19th century to the famous Crystal Palace exhibition in London in 1851, Palissy's originals were exhibited there. And like many of the historic art forms that were on display there, they inspired quite the artistic revival and thus Portuguese Palissy where it was born. And uh, Portuguese wares have gained like quite a following and we're quite lucky to have these beautiful examples and we have um, a few others. And I also wanna note that no creepy crawlies were harmed in the making of these pieces, just the originals. So continuing back to Spain, um, one of the more recent strengths in our collection is from Alcora, um, which is a um, actually in Castellón, not far from, from Valencia. Um, and I'm showing you here the bust of the, the founder, um, sorry, a bust of the son of the founder of the factory. Um, this is the 10th Count of Aranda, uh, but it was actually um, the 9th Count of Aranda, Buena, Buen Ventura, Jimenez de Orea y Abalca de Abolea. He founded the Royal Ceramic Factory of Alcora with a particular interest in the growing taste for French style decoration. Um, and decorative arts, and which was a shift um, that took place shortly after the grandson of Louis XIV of France ascended to the Spanish throne as Philip V. Um, and this is a time when the decor of Versailles actually becomes an important part of, of court decoration, of course, and everybody wants to kind of be up with fashion. So um, it's that's a really important um, uh, part of the story when we talk about Alcora, uh, because the ninth Count Durand inherits his property and starts his factory and brings French fashion. So what does he do to bring French fashion to his factory? But he hires some uh, potters from Moustier and Marseille, and one of whom was Joseph Alaris, um, who from Marseille to come to Alcora and start the workshop. And actually what I'm showing you here on the right is a original copy of the contract um, with Olaris uh, from 1726. And it was a year before the factory was founded. Um, and I just wanna say that we have really a treasure trove of archives from the factory for anybody who's interested in studying uh, this material. We don't have a ton of time to go through um, the, um, all the pieces, but we have almost 90 pieces in the collection um, and I'm just going to show you a few examples. And I know that Alex is particularly excited, I think is about this one. Alex, you're on mute, sorry. Oh, thanks. 
Um, so I want to preface this by saying that I took a number of graduate courses, both at the Bar Graduate Center and Parsons Cooper Hewitt program that discuss at length both the SEV manufacturing in France and Meissen in Germany, which was fascinating, but I had never heard of the Spanish equivalent, um, the Alcora Royal Manufactory or Buen Retiro, which we'll be discussing shortly. And I was absolutely thrilled when Margaret gave me a beautiful catalog of an exhibition she had curated a number of years ago called Alcora in Nueva York, which details all of these pieces um, of in the Hispanics' incredible holdings. But long story short, um, for about 150 years, the factory was producing these decorative and luxury ceramic wares for private homes, monasteries, and royal palaces throughout Spain. And they were wide, widely coveted and um, exported to other countries in Europe and in the Americas as well. And here we have our first introduction to the Mansarina, which is a saucer that was used to um, contain chocolate and a fountain on the left in um, the famous blue and white. And I think Margaret and I can readily agree that the Mansarina is one of our personal favorite examples. And if you go to the next slide, Margaret, I think there's sure. a few more examples. Um, sure. Oh. Yeah, I just yeah, I just wanted to quickly. This is a this is really one of the most um, really extraordinary pieces um, uh, of all of the uh, ninety some odd pieces we have in the collection, and it shows an image of the uh, Battle of Porus against. Uh, Battle of Alexander against Porus um, from a, a print uh, based on the, the painting actually that was never produced by Charles Lebrun for Versailles, um, but it really is quite extraordinary. And if you are familiar with the um, pieces from Marseille and Moustier, you'll see clearly a, a connection. Um, and here are some other um, mansarinas uh, that Alex was referring to, um, which are really quite extraordinary. One. Um, should I show you the source of these pieces? Um, a, an example in silver uh, from Mexico. And then you have the hikara, which is the, it's actually a, a, a Chinese teacup form that was used to hold the chocolate. And then of course the mansarina, I mean, hold the chocolate in the chocolate cup. And then the mansarina, um, Alex, if you wanna wrap it up on the mansarina is kind of the fun story. Yes. Um, so the name Mansarina itself um, is said to have come from the Viceroy of Peru uh, between 1639 and 1648, who was also the Marquis of Mancera. And as legend has it, the Viceroy struggled with hand tremors due to Parkinson's disease. And the French name for this type of form, the Trembleuse, also seems to corroborate this tale, although no documentation has been found to support the veracity. But if the story is true, um, one could argue that the Mansarina and Hikara represent a unique manifestation of what we would consider today um, to be disability conscious design, which I think is really important. And um, if you go to the next slide, you can see how the form evolved. It originally um, began as a simple round shape and um, it continues into this elaborate shell that we see quite often in the pieces in the collection. And then, the very charming example on the right of the beautiful dove. And without going into detail of all these pieces, um, this is really cool. Margaret was able to find the stencil that actually accompanied this piece, again, inspired um, by chinoiserie motifs um, relating to the trade and the, the popularity of these exotic motifs during the 18th century. Um, so we're just, yeah, go ahead. Alex. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to run through um, other examples from the factory. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to go great depth in all these pieces because we wanted to really do a survey of, of really all of the wonderful pieces we have in the collection. But um, here's um, kind of a tasting of, of several of them. And this last one, Alex, I don't know if you wanted to, if you were going to talk about this. Uh, yeah, this is um, a beautiful, um, very Rococo play. Um, it depicts scenes of Versailles and Paris. You can see Notre Dame and it has this spectacular Rocaille border. And again, it's a testament of how 
the Spanish Empire and much of Europe was looking to France for the latest fashions. And at the same time, France is regularly borrowing artistic inspiration from the rest of the world. So it's this constant exchange. And, um, you know, that's sort of the beauty of ceramics and decorative arts is that it's, you know, all interconnected. Right. Um, and then finally, we have this Alcora creamware basket, and there's a page from a late 18th century pattern book from Redwood that shows similar designs. And then last but not least, we have um, another representation of the Count in Jasperware, and then this beautiful gilded plate uh, made of true porcelain with these beautiful painterly moths made with gilding that's just absolutely beautiful. And then I'll briefly talk about um, the Royal Manufactory of uh, Buen Retiro, which was also a very important production center for fine ceramics and located in Madrid, where the famous park is. The manufactory opened in the latter half of the 18th century and was founded by Carlos III, who brought 52 modelers, painters, decorators, and potters from the Capo di Monte factory in Naples to Madrid um, when he was crowned King of Spain in 1759. And I also want to note that it was under Charles III that prompted the famous excavations of Pompeii and Herculaneum that fueled this fury of decorative arts influenced by classical antiquity that produced these beautiful neoclassical pieces shown here. And the Hispanic Society has about two dozen pieces from the Buen Retiro, Buen Retiro factory. And these include plates, snuff boxes, figurines, and vases. And um, just a little bit more history, um, the Royal Palaces of Madrid and Aranjuez have two rooms that were um, specifically designed to highlight these um, porcelain objects from Buen Retiro. And like the uh, manufactory at Sev, at this time, Buen Retiro also produced a combination of soft paste and hard paste porcelain that was, um, as was the fashion, greatly influenced by classical antiquity. And um, when Retiro also produced pieces that were similar to the unglazed biscuit uh, blue jasperware that we generally associate with Wedgwood, but Wedgwood itself was inspired by the newly excavated ancient Roman cameo glass. So again, this incredible exchange, but unfortunately, um, the um, before the end of the decade of the, I think it was 1810, um, Napoleon's troops entered in Madrid um, around spring of 1808, and they assumed control of the factory, which essentially precipitated its demise. So um, just well, a sad ending there, but beautiful, beautiful pieces. Well, it's nice that we have some examples in our collection. So now I'm going to trans transport us back across the Atlantic um, to Mexico um, to just very briefly talk about the Puebla, the pottery from Puebla, Mexico. Um, uh, I did do a dedicated tertulia. Um, geez, I think it was uh, two years ago now. It was one of the first tertulias. So if you're interested in this topic, um, I'm just going to briefly, briefly touch on it. But if you're interested, you're welcome to uh, watch the tertulia. Um, but um, I, this is one of my, I have to admit, one of my favorite pieces in the collection. Um, and it really kind of inspired me to focus my dissertation on the, on the topic. Um, there's really something quite wonderful um, about it. But giving a little bit of background, um, I mentioned earlier that um, the uh, tin glazed earthenware became so, tin lead based earthenware became so important in Spain. And um, in Mesoamerica, there had long been a very sophisticated ceramic tradition long before the Spanish arrived. However, potters um, did not have um, in Mesoamerica, did not have the potter's wheel, although they had a form of the potter's wheel that I've seen, um, but it wasn't quite the same, um, nor did they have uh, the glazes and uh, nor did they have the, the, uh, the, the, the kilns that could produce the type of temperature. They did use pit fire kilns, um, but not um, the, what the Romans introduced um, with these um, kilns that um, were, would allow you to uh, fire these pieces at a high temperature and achieve these glazes. Um, so these were all techniques that were brought uh, to Mexico by the Spaniards 
um, at, and soon after they arrived, um, as early as I think we see workshops, we know pieces are arriving in Mexico um, because they're new settlers. They want pieces that they're familiar to using um, to eat from. Um, and so the demand for these glazed vessels became such that the Spanish just couldn't keep up with the demand. So they started um, producing them locally. So we know as early as like 15, 30 workshops are already opening in Mexico City. And um, as Mexico began to develop, um, the city of Puebla de Los Angeles was founded in 1534 as really a center for the production of um, uh, a variety of European style um, items such as soap, glass, ceramics, and later textiles. Um, so Puebla becomes a really important city um, and the center for production of, um, of this material that um, today is popularly known as Talavera, which makes it very complicated because we have the city of Talavera in, in um, Spain, but clearly it wasn't so much, certainly there were potters that were coming to Mexico from Puebla, but that was not the, I mean, I'm sorry, from Talavera, but that wasn't the only center um, uh, from which potters were um, immigrating. Uh, they were all over, but in the ordinances that were um, developed for the potters in Puebla as, in uh, 1653, they even specify that one of the director decorations should be similar to that of Talavera. So it, it makes it sort of complicated. The term Talavera um, does not begin to, use, to be used in Mexico really until the 19th century. So I'm very careful about using the term um, today to describe these objects. Now, going back to this piece, um, this is a wonderful piece. Clearly, you see the important influence of Chinese uh, porcelain coming into Mexico as early as the 16th century. Um, but it really, what's wonderful about it is that it's really, it's not Chinese, it's not Spanish, it's they're creating something totally new. Um, and so it's, it's really a tradition um, that not only do we appreciate today, but even at the time it became so widely um, distributed, not only in Mexico, but all over the Spanish territories. Um, um, as far as we find pieces in, in the islands of Georgia, Florida, you see them in, uh, in California, um, as well as South America with some, um, of course, going back to Spain, but mostly it was destined to stay in the Americas. Um, and just very briefly, I'm showing you some details. I really think that this piece um, kind of reflects some of the festivities that were happening in, in Mexico um, and in, you know, throughout in, in major cities, but I don't really have time to talk about it today, but it's really quite wonderful. Oh, I should mention that this mark at the bottom, H-E, um, is attributed to the potter Damon Hernandez, who was one of the founders of the Potter's Guild of 1563. So I'm just going to show you very quickly some of the other pieces we have in our collection, including this one on the right, which was it's actually one of the early first pieces that I acquired for the museum when I arrived and it had been in a California collection and it's a tile panel uh, from the late um, 18th century of the Virgin of the Immaculate Conception. Now here's some other pieces which were kind of fun. And I, it was quite a nice surprise to see that an almost identical uh, tile panel appears on this church of San Marcos in Puebla, which, which was actually the seat of the P Potter's Guild beginning in the 16th century. Another tradition I just wanna touch on very quickly and also one that I've spoken, um, touched on in other um, tertulias and online uh, lectures, is the uh, tradition known as Bucaros de las Indias. Um, now the Bucaros de las Indias tradition represents burnished pottery from Tonalá, Mexico, uh, Natán in Panama, and Santiago de Chile. And I'm just showing you, this is one example with these um, really interesting, it's kind of Ormolu mounts, which were added in France um, in the 18th century, we believe. Um, and the, unlike the uh, Puebla pottery, which was really for distribution in the Americas, uh, Tonala, as well as the, all the Bucaros de las Indias were 
both distributed in uh, the Americas, and they were also largely distributed, uh, sent to Spain, as well as to Italy, uh, where we find a pieces. So it's not that surprising to see this piece. Um, it must have broken. It was an important piece. Uh, there's a whole tradition of eating this ware, um, which if you're interested, uh, check out the tertulia, but it's really quite uh, rich uh, material and has quite a bit of uh, material written on it. Um, contemporary literature written on this material. Here's another example from, uh, from Tona, attributed to Tonala um, in this wonderful micaceous clay. And I was thinking, Alex, about the, um, the Portuguese palace ware, and of course the, the French palace ware, the Portuguese, of course, is later. This is uh, 17th century with these wonderful um, uh, fish and you see a little bird and um, insects and frogs appearing on the inside of the vessel. And it really, I think, forms part of this tradition of, of drinking water. And I think that the fact that this came from the other world um, was symbolic um, when they were drinking water from these cups. They were very, they had this wonderful quality of evaporating the water and also gave off a wonderful aroma. Um, but it's, it's a really quite rich material. And here they are in um, other forms. There's, these are very unusual sculptural forms, um, also in micaceous clay. And I think that that, oh, and then we have these um, altar lamps um, that are also relatively new acquisitions um, that uh, actually we were able to find uh, references to altar lamps uh, from Chile. Um, as well as in uh, contemporary paintings, um, we see these appear um, as in, in use as altar lamps. Now, the, um, the pieces from Chile are quite different from the ones we see from Tonala, but it's really the Spanish who kind of unify these bur burnished pottery traditions as Bucaros de las Indias. And the word Bucaros comes from Pucaro, the Portuguese. The Portuguese which is kind of another complicated element. The Portuguese also uh, produced um, burnished pottery that's in some ways is very similar to the pieces that we see. And clearly there's a connection that needs to be further studied. Uh, the pieces from Chile are really quite distinct in that they're often painted these wonderful colors. Um, and these are uh, two of three examples that we have in, in the Hispanic Society collection. Um, but really quite wonderful. And if you go to the Metropolitan Museum, they recently acquired a, a lovely uh, pair that they, I believe, still have on exhibition in their American wing. So, so that is it for what we wanted to show you on our tour of these ceramic uh, collections. Um, I just had a couple questions of, of Alex, and then we'll open up. Oops, let me stop sharing my, um, my screen. Um, just to get the conversation started, Alex. Um, you know, Alex has been doing some really interesting research on um, the Estrado. And so I wonder, Alex, if you could just take a brief moment um, now that we've surveyed this uh, ceramic um, collection of the Hispanic Society, just explain very briefly uh, what the Estrado is and what types of pottery would you see in the Estrado? Sure. Um, well, the Estrado was a room or a demarcated area within a larger room that was um, used for female occupancy, um, largely among the upper classes um, across the Spanish Empire until it kind of disappears into the 19th century. But it begins um, in Islamic Al-Andalus. So it has these origins in the harem and it's... Um, it's essentially a parlor and at the same time it's almost a cabinet of curiosities so you find um there's also a lot of social practices that go on as well as private relaxation so you have of course mansarinas and consumption of chocolate especially in new spain um and margaret has a wonderful tertulia on it on the consumption of chocolate and the history of that um and uh, there's also, of course, um, these Bucaros de las Indias that Margaret just spoke about. Um, and again, this sort of curious habit of consuming them. Um, again, she elaborates on this 
um, in another Tertulia, but I highly recommend because they would eat pieces of pottery and it was very fragrant and there's this crazy, you know, lore behind it. And um, you would also have um, a lot of Chinese export porcelain. You would have the pieces from Alcora. Um, again, it would definitely vary when from region to region, but I would say that especially as you get into the 18th century, it's a really nice make sure that you see an inventories with its own specialized vocabulary. And um, this is a woman's space. So it's, it's really fascinating what you learn from, you know, these inventories and the various components. Involved. So I imagine that they would be both like some people, like we have today, some things are on like a display, maybe in a cabinet, um, but then other things are being used, like because of the Estrada was a space where you would, you know, drink tea or chocolate or um so it's kind of both right you would have maybe um both in in use and i think that's one of the challenges i think that we are all um face that we have these objects in in museum collections but we really want to you know talk about them and how they were put put to practice because these were they didn't exist in isolation they were kind of you know, one the one of the wonderful things is that they were used. They spoke about uh, how we how people ate, how they um, decorated their homes, uh, you know, a little uh, different from other uh, art forms. Mm -hmm. um, did you I have, have a question for you, sure. Mark? <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could speak to the prevalence of blue and white ceramics um, across time. Sure. Um, you know, it's 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 a great question. I can't say I can easily answer it. Um, blue on the on most part came from cobalt and cobalt is a very expensive, still is um, expensive to source. And um, and in Spain, it probably came from North Africa. Um, what I always find interesting when um, when we get to the to Mexico, just the, the amount of blue. And actually in Mexico, the use of blue in the ordinances could only be used by the, what they called master potters uh, because it was so expensive. But then when we look at the pieces um, so much, it was almost as if they had exhaustive amounts of cobalt to just throw on these pieces. So there's certainly, I mean, I showed um, one piece that was, is, you know, beautifully painted, but there's some that are kind of sloppy. Um, so to me, it would suggest that maybe it wasn't so expensive. So I'm constantly kind of looking for what is the source, where are they getting the cobalt from and why would not, why wouldn't have been as expensive. Now, I, I did find a document when I was doing my research um, from 1601, um, a potter named Gaspar de Encinas writes to his wife, uh, who's still in Spain, and says, can you please send me some co some um, colors, some oxides, and among them is cobalt. So he's still asking for it to be sent from Spain. Um, so, but that's 1601. But yes, it's a great question, um, and one that we're continuing to kind of study and understand. So um, we have this wonderful, uh, Woman Laura, if, if she's <laughs> helping us here today, you know, we don't see her, but Laura um, Rivera uh, Ayala, uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi, Margaret, we do. One of her viewers wants to know about the third baptismal font in the presentation. She noticed a muslin symbol. And the mm -hmm. question is, was that a, a common practice at the time? So, um, so the Baptismal font. So the I think she's talking about the baptismal font we have in our collection does have those wonderful symbols, and they absolutely come from um, uh, they're they're absolutely um, Muslim. Um, the um, I, in fact I can show it and let's see go back from the beginning. Here we go. Here we go. Um, I assume she's talking about they're all over this vessel. So here's the hand and the eye, and then you see it repeated here and around uh, the vessel. 
So she's absolutely right. And it's quite wonderful because it really shows that there's, you know, um, this, you know, we don't always think about um, how people live together. Um, most of these vessels that we've looked at are, I mean, the, the even, even after um, the expulsion of, of um, Muslim potters, um, or the expulsion of the um, Muslims in Spain, they continue to make pottery because they're the ones who have really, have been for a long time, been making pottery um, in Spain. And in, in actually the continued even after their expulsion um, in Valencia where they're protected um, until the early 17th century. Um, but this is a piece from Toledo from the 1400s um, and so, you know, it's, it's hard to speak today about how people live together, but you do have these potters who are making things for the church, um, and they added these symbols to this piece, which makes us think about how people lived together at the time and how they treated these symbols at that time. And it's a really, really interesting um, thing to look at. Great, thank you. Another question is, um, if you could speak more about patterns of collecting during the early 20th century, was Huggington unique in his ambition to collect so much lusterware in particular? So no, Huntington was not unique in collecting lusterware. Um, we, there, I mean, in, in the United States, even he wasn't unique. Maybe the quantity um, was somewhat unique. And Huntington was, had much more of an academic approach to collecting. Um, he was looking to really represent all the various traditions, um, whereas some collectors were looking to just uh, collect what was important to them at the time. So lusterware was heavily collected. You see it, particularly if you go to um, Hearst Castle, you'll see Lusterware. Um, you know, he uh, collected, there's actually still apparently crates of Lusterware in, in the collection that are not even on view. Um, uh, but every museum, almost every kind of um, encyclopedic museum around the world has examples of Spanish Lusterware uh, because it's considered kind of the, uh, an art form that was really um, quite important for Spain. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we also have a question about the Donala Cups. Um, how many are known to still exist? And since they're so special um, beyond function, how rare are they? So we're actually quite fortunate. I mean, the Hispanic Society has a nice collection, which by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, had come from, we have the provenance that goes back to the Aldo Bran, Bran, Branzini family um, in, in uh, Florence. Um, Brandini, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, they, they um, but there are quite a few cups in various collections. Um, if you go to uh, Spain, for example, um, the National, the Museum of Archaeology, the National Museum of Archaeology in Madrid has um, uh, had a collection that was donated by um, a private collector who assembled, actually she assembled and then it was, uh, her collection was added to by her descendants. It became, a, it was, I think, a number 3000, um, which is quite extraordinary examples of not just Tonala, but also from various other, you know, these areas that I mentioned from Chile, from um, Panama, she probably in there had some pieces from Portugal and from Spain. Um, that collection is now at the Museo de America. Um, so it's definitely worth taking a look there. The, the Victorian Albert also has a collection. I think the British Museum has a collection. So, so you see them also in, um, in these smaller museums throughout Europe, you see them. And um, a lot, actually what I have found is they often don't know what they have. Um, they're found in storage, um, uh, you know, shelves and in, in, in storage rooms. So 
Um, there are definitely uh, many more that exist that we even know about today, um, despite the fact that they were eating fragments of these pieces, um, uh, there still are quite a number of pieces. Now, what's what would be important is really assembling, um, having a better understanding of where they all came from. Um, I think there is some questions about um, the Portuguese, uh, you know, conundrum. There are many pieces that we're not sure whether Portuguese or uh, from Mexico. And I think that's something that should be further studied. But yes, there are pieces that still remain out there. So we have two more questions. Um, do you have any 20th or 21st century pottery in the collection? Alex, you want to take that one or? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so um, we do. Um, we do have pieces. And actually, Huntington um, was really interested when, you know, when I spoke speak about Huntington and his kind of academic approach, he really wanted to um, survey all the important um, uh, areas of production. But he also was interested in collecting the more popular vessel types. And so he set out his uh, curators to acquire pieces. Um, in fact, I think, let me see if I have a slide. Uh, I think I have at the very end, sorry, forgive me for a moment. I, I was thought this might come up and I wanted to talk about it more. There we go. Um, Huntington um, had curators go and, and collect pieces that really represent specific areas, regional pottery from that kind of were very unique to that area. Sorry, I'm just bringing everyone through the whole presentation to find, oh, here they are. Um, these are pamphlets that um, were published in like the 30s, I think, um, uh, over you know a couple decades, uh, focusing on these different traditions. So that I think really goes back to this idea of what, what was Huntington's vision assembling these collections. So it wasn't just the kind of high style wear, but also the more popular uh, pieces that were in daily use in people's homes. It's not I actually it's been in our galleries and what we call the North Building um, and uh, visitors saying to me, oh my goodness, I have a piece just like that, or my grandmother has a piece like that. Um, and that's that's why we want people to make that, I think Huntington wanted people to make that connection um, and that they're so typical of these regional traditions. Um, I would love to continue to collect um, into the 21st uh, century. We have actually received a few donations. Um, uh, of, of pieces from, from Mexico and from Spain and um, would love to continue to build on, on those. It's sort of one area that we really um, need to focus on. Yes, and I think that relates to the last question, which is, are there any areas of the ceramic collection that you would like to build? So, yes, I think that um, I think it would be great to, to continue to expand, not just, um, you know, also with contemporary artists. Uh, I did an exhibition in 1999 on the Mexican ceramics uh, from Puebla, and um, we uh, paired it with um, a number of artists who were not kind of trained to, to work in tin glazed earthenware, but were invited in a workshop to, um, to kind of create new pieces. And I think that that's, um, you know, interesting way to continue these traditions, um, but also look at artists who are, you know, that are trained in creating really unique uh, works uh, today. So, absolutely, lots of work to do. So I think that that's it. Um, we're wrapping it up. It's almost seven. Um, and I think we kind of provided more than a marathon of a survey of our collection um, and really just barely skimming the surface. Um, but I hope that we whet your appetite, encourage um, sort of a desire to learn more about uh, ceramic traditions from Spain, Portugal, Mexico, um, and Chile. 
Um, and uh, what I think is important is that you, you know, we want to share that it's, um, you don't have to be a connoisseur or historian to really enjoy these wonderful traditions. Uh, each of these pieces tells a story and it's our job to really make sure that these, that their stories are told. Um, I just want to take an opportunity and say thank you to Alexander Rodriguez, Jack, for participating in this tertulia, um, sharing her research and insight with us. Um, she's really been a wonderful addition to the Hispanic Science. Continue to uh, work with us in our education department and, and help us in other capacities as she finishes her thesis. Um, and um, again, if you haven't seen the exhibit, I really encourage you to come to the museum. The exhibit closes October 16th, so you have another um, less than two weeks. So um, please um, come and enjoy it. I want to thank you all for joining. Um, I want to thank Laura and, and Alex uh, for really helping support these tertulias. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the next Tertulia, which is Tuesday, November 1st, with um, John O'Neill, who is curator of manuscripts and rare books. And he'll be speaking about Antonio de Nebrija's 500th anniversary, which should be really, really interesting. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank Goodbye. you, Margaret. Bye.